morning, everybody, and welcome to this month's IEHG NDTP UCD Grand Rounds. And we're delighted this morning to have Dr. John Fitzsimons, consultant pediatrician at CHI at Temple Street and clinical director for quality improvement, HSE National Quality and Patient Safety Directorate, who's going to talk to us about the science of patient safety. And uh, John is one of Ireland's leading lights on this topic, and we have a very uh, um, involved panel who we'll be introducing afterwards. John has done a lot of work in this area, including uh, co-editing this fantastic book here, uh, Handbook of Patient Safety. So without further ado, I'll hand over to John for his presentation. Thanks, Tomás, and, and thank you very much uh, to IEHG for the uh, invite to come this morning. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and uh, to talk to you about something that I am uh, passionate and have worked, you know, for um, over 10 years now in the field of patient safety. And I'd like to share with you, I, I suppose, some of my thoughts uh, about how uh, safety has evolved. And, and so I'm just going to move my slides on there. So uh, the learning outcomes for this morning's session, um, I hope at the end of this session, you'll, we'll have uh, reviewed the, the history of, of patient safety. Uh, and particularly the science of patient safety. And we'll talk a lot about why patient safety is a science. Uh, appreciate the challenges and the opportunities of defining safety because that, that, that actually opens up some interesting uh, ideas. Um, gonna describe to you three complementary systems um, uh, approaches to patient safety. Um, and some of them are relatively new ideas and some of them are actually still very much in development. But we're also going to look at some of the critical supports for patient safety, uh, the things that, that in the background are needed to make it happen. And then I, I really want this to be a practical uh, uh, talk about patient safety. So we're going to talk about lots of examples of patient safety in practice, and it may not cover all the things that you do, but I'm sure we'll, we'll, you'll see similarities in, 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 in your work and where some of these ideas can be translated into your work. So maybe just starting with that question, is, is patient safety a science? Well, uh, I think if you look at the definition of a science, and, and, and I've gone to, to Wikipedia for some guidance here, and uh, uh, you know, if science is the systematic uh, organization of knowledge, uh, knowledge that comes from uh, you know, the use of data, the uh, observation, experimentation, uh, to bring uh, together explanations that can be validated, well, then I think patient safety science is uh, a real thing. I think we have, uh, you know, good, robust uh, evidence now that, that uh, there are patient safety interventions that can make care safe, and uh, we'll talk about that as we go along. So I think it's been helpful to start thinking about patient safety as a science, and particularly in the context of healthcare, where uh, having uh, an evidence base is so important. And let's go right back. And I think uh, everybody's familiar with this uh, dictum or maxim from the uh, from Hippocrates of, of first do no harm. Um, and and uh, I find this remarkable that, that the Greeks uh, focused on this, uh, you know, straight away. There were so many other things you could have said first do, first relieve suffering or first heal people. But uh, there was a, a realization very early on in healthcare that um, when we went to, 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 to heal people or to help them, there was a risk that we could harm them. Uh, and being aware of that was really important uh, to try and avoid uh, any harm. And even though we got in there early, I think, uh, with, with that, that um, insight, uh, it, it kind of took a long time really before healthcare caught back up to this. And we have to look at other industries and uh, probably the, the industrial revolution when machines uh, got bigger and hotter and more dangerous, uh, that people start thinking about safety at, a, at an organizational level. And you see things like the railroads and you see law coming into to, to being in the uh, 1800s you know, to regulate how the railroads work. And then as, again, industry becomes more and more complex and things like high-speed transport or nuclear fuel, um, there's a lot more uh, attention being paid to, to safety uh, because of the, the risk of if, if some of these things go wrong, that they are so disastrous. But healthcare is kind of doing its own thing for, for a lot of this time. Um, maybe because it's making such great advances, I think, you know, it, it tends to ignore safety. And we have to wait until uh, this, I suppose, landmark study in 1991 
And again, the study started uh, seven years earlier in, in the mid 1980s in New York State, where uh, the team here uh, looked at, at uh, 30,000 uh, medical notes from, from 50 uh, practices in, in New York State. And for the first time ever, uh, really on a national scale, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, they found there was a significant uh, uh, adverse event rate uh, in, in medical practice. Uh, their number was 3.7% of, of hospitalizations resulted in, a, in a, uh, an adverse event. That's, that's what they called it. Um, and uh, interestingly, probably their, their uh, definition of, of, of harm or adverse events was, was, was relatively high. So uh, when, when people have replicated this study, they've found higher levels. But, but even at that 3.7%, this you know, certainly uh, generated a lot of interest. And, and uh, estimates from this study uh, came up with this number uh, in, this, in the US at the time of, of the possibility that there was 100,000 deaths annually happening in the US um, uh, that were attributable to patient safety uh, events. And so that really kind of galvanized people to, to, to do something about this. And these two landmark, um, they're both books, uh, but they were uh, kind of published as reports uh, from the Institute of Medicine in the US to Ur is Human, and then two years later, Crossing the Quality Chasm, they really redefined um, what, what safety and quality actually within healthcare was all about. And that first report there, that's where we get the, the domains of quality that, you know, quality care is safe, it's timely, it's effective, efficient, uh, equitable, and person-centered. So, you know, these, these, these reports have really uh, driven things on. And in Ireland, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we too kind of woke up to this, I think, on the back of, of, of those reports. There were similar reports in the UK and then in Ireland. This was the, 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 um, the Madden report from, from 2008, Building a Culture of Safety, um, uh, on the back of the, the Lourdes inquiry and other uh, safety uh, um, uh, scandals that had happened in Ireland. And that's just a word cloud of, of, of some of the, the terms here. And this was a really important report and still is and still informs a lot of the things that happen within safety. But you can see there, a lot of the words here are uh, more about regulation, reporting. Um, and, and so it was very much of its time, um, but uh, I think it was certainly a good, a good start. And uh, uh, we've been using kind of many of the things from this ever since. We've also done our own studies here um, and these are the Irish National Adverse <clears throat> Event Studies, um, which were published in 2015 and 2020, uh, looking at data from 2009 and, and 2015. Uh, and you can see there that, that, that um, Ireland is similar to other countries. So um, when studies are done around the world, we find a harm rate um, uh, in healthcare of somewhere between 10 and 15%. And so the INES 2 study, which was 2015 data showed that 14% of, of patients uh, who were hospitalized experienced an adverse event. And, and uh, some of those events are, are preventable. And then this, I suppose, is, is the, the, the most current um, Irish document um, that is really guiding things. It's, it's the uh, HSE's patient safety strategy. Um, and this uh, has six uh, commitments um, and uh, those, the first two are about empowering and engaging patients and staff to improve patient safety. Uh, uh, the, the third one, anticipating and responding to risks. Uh, fourth one is reducing common causes of harm. The fifth is using information. And finally, leadership and governance. So they're all critical features that lead to patient safety. And I just want to zoom in on one of those, the, the, the fourth movement there, reducing common causes of harm. And, uh, you can recognize many of those uh, harm uh, uh, areas from, from where you work um, because they are different right across the, the health service. Um, but, you know, at, at the heart of it, patient safety in many ways is about reducing harm. And maybe this is a good place to ask that question. So what, what is patient safety? Well, this is the definition that comes from Charles Vincent, who's uh, a researcher in this area and has probably been one of the the people who's, who's uh, contributed most to the field, I'd say, in the last 40 years. Um, and, and Charles Vincent just describes it as been the avoidance, prevention, and amelioration of adverse events or injuries, and we call that harm, stemming from the process of healthcare. And in one sense, you know, that is certainly the goal of, uh, of patient safety. 
but in one sense, it's a definition that's not about safety. It's, it's actually about the lack or the absence of safety. So, so harm is what happens when we don't have safety. Uh, the, the word safe literally means, it comes from the old French sof, which means to, to, to be without, so to be without harm. And other people, especially from other industries, have asked, you know, maybe, you know, this, this definition of, of, of safety is a little narrow. And so Eric Hulnegel, uh, who, uh, again, is another researcher uh, in, in safety, not just in healthcare, uh, he likes to define safety as being the ability to succeed under varying conditions. So in this, he's really defining safety, but what it is that we do, uh, and uh, the consequence of that is that we, um, uh, we avoid harm. And there's some merit in, 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 in using both definitions here. I think we can't avoid the need to, to, to look at harm, um, but there's something to be learned when we think about you know, the practice of safety. And I think one thing at this stage that's absolutely clear, and perhaps it took a long while for healthcare to take this on board, and it certainly has come from other industries. And, and that's the, the fact that, that safety is a systems property. Um, we've taken some time to move away from the fact that when things go wrong, it's not about uh, a bad actor, uh, at least, you know, in only the rarest of, of, of times, you know, it's usually the result of, of system problems. And we've been able to, to kind of build that into more advanced models. And, and so this, in terms of our three approaches to safety is, is the first, you know, it's the idea that, that if we find and fix failure, if we can learn from the things that went wrong, that we can prevent harm. Um, and so that means, uh, you know, if there's an incident, we, we try and recognize it and then we learn from it and we analyze what happened and we try and fix uh, the problems. And so this is, a, again, from Charles Vincent, this is a, the organizational accident model. This many people may have been seen this before as, as what was called the London Protocol, um, where, which was used for, for incident investigation. So, you know, harm is there. Uh, it's it's often very obvious, but uh, you need to go further upstream through the defenses and barriers, what, what James Reason called the Swiss cheese effect. So these, these are the, the things that unfortunately the harm event gets through. And then looking at things like errors and violations uh, and unsafe acts, but recognizing that, you know, there's usually further kind of contributing factors upstage, uh, upstream. So environmental factors, staff, team, task factors, and even beyond that, again, there's there's uh, uh, organizational uh, uh, factors, and even you could say at the, uh, beyond that again, political or social factors. And so upstream, we have these idea of latent failures, and they can be hard to see. Uh, and we can often focus maybe a little bit too much on the active failures. And so, you know, one of the problems with with looking at active failures is 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 this idea that we we spend a lot of time, you know. Uh, in, in spaces that, that are violating the rules that we make. So if we're gonna you know, look at the violations of rules, that's a very complex thing to look at because if you take this example from Rene M. Alberti who talks about uh, driving here. So most of us drive 50 kilometers an hour when that's what the speed sign says, but you know, that's often something that, that uh, is uh, something that we interpret depending on life pressures, you know, whether we believe that's an appropriate 50 kilometer sign, whether it's busy on the road, whether it's nighttime, daytime, uh, lots of things that might change that. And for many of us, we spend a lot of time in what Amalberti calls the illegal normal space. Uh, and this is where we, uh, you know, we, we often operate because we have to, because we're busy, because uh, if, we, if we adhered to all the rules, we'd never get to do all the things that we need to do. Uh, and often the, the move from this legal space into the illegal normal space can be gradual as, as, as uh, uh, an American psychologist called Diane Vaughan uh, described it as the normalization of deviance where, where you can accidentally move from, from, from being in the wrong or the right place to the wrong place. So when you look back and you try and interpret what's gone wrong, violation is a difficult thing. So, you know, did someone break a rule or deviate from a guideline? Well, that may be because they had to. And so I think, you know, examples of this uh, are the HSE incident management framework, which is really there to help see the whole system. Um, and uh, it's a, you know, really good document. And I think uh, is informed by lots of the newer ideas in patient safety as well. Um, and even to take that uh, another step forward, this is from the UK. This is the health safety investigation branch. Um, and even that 
that that wording investigation branch that's been taken from aviation transport where um, when when uh, air accidents happen, it's the uh, uh, air accident investigation branch goes out. But they are people who are highly skilled and a multidisciplinary team uh, from aviation, from psychology, human factors, people that, that can uh, interpret um, what's gone wrong and really, really try and pull the lessons out. So uh, learning from failure, uh, you know, is something that we're still we're still advancing. But a lot of this is about focusing on this left side of the, the curve here. You know, should we only learn when things go wrong? And this is the idea of, of safety being different than just the absence of harm. And one of the concepts that's been put forward is that of safety too, which is learning from why things go right. Uh, and, and, you know, that's equally important, but it can be a little harder to see. And so again, uh, uh, this is this is another thing, thing uh, approach that needs to be uh, factored into our model. So understanding risk, managing it, and 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 reliability, so that there are, you know, certain things that we do every day uh, that we need to uh, to understand and pay attention to them because they are actually the roots of safety. And a lot of these ideas have come from uh, what we call high reliability organizations. Um, and uh, these again come from those safety critical places where high speed transport or nuclear power where you know the, the, the thought of something going wrong is so disastrous that people really need to, to spend a lot of time uh, working on it and I, I just want to uh, it's the last line of this I think that I, I, I like the most you know high reliability organizations live by the book but are unwilling to die by it. So you know that that's that you know that that says so much. There's something here about rules and understanding them, but also you know knowing when they need to to change them. And people have analysed these places, and and you know they do a number of things you know to be uh, high reliability organisations. They have sensitivity to operations, so they know what's going on. Uh, there's a reluctance to simplify, so they they really understand their work and 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 understand failure. Um, um, and and they can you know really kind of pull out deep lessons from that. Um, there's a deference to expertise, so that when they train people, they trust people to do the right job. And finally, there's a resilience, a resilience that 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 is embedded within the organization, not not just in individuals, but across the the system and in the team. And so again, Charles Vincent uh, uh, about ten years ago now proposed the framework for measuring and monitoring patient safety and he took some of these ideas so up the top there you've got past harm so that's still you know it's still important to learn from what's goes what goes wrong um but he took some of those high reliability ideas and he put them into practice so you know are our clinical systems and processes reliable so you know um uh, the, 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 the things that we do every day uh, that keep patients safe so simple things hand hygiene communication uh, and i'll show you some more of those in a moment sensitivity to operations do we know what's going on today do we know where the risks are within our care systems in our hospitals do we know uh, where we need to divert uh, most attention to and then when we do can we uh, anticipate and prepare um, and mitigate uh, any risks that are there and deal with them and then finally can we bring all that together and this was at the same time uh, as, as that model came out, so did this, and I, I don't want to uh, burden you with too many models, but I just want to, to, to show that the key thing here is, are these two outside um, uh, arcs? So uh, the learning system there, which is, you know, how do we learn uh, in order to be safe? So again, that's back to the science of patient safety. Um, and then culture, uh, the, 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 the absolute importance of culture here. Um, and then where those two overlap is in leadership. Uh, and that's why it's so important, I think, that, that we have leadership for patient safety uh, interprofessionally and, and throughout our organizations. So just, you know, a long list of safety critical practices, and, and, and you could probably add many more when you think about it. What are the things that you do every day that lead to patient safety? So, you know, spending time focusing on those, ensuring that they happen reliably, uh, that's actually a really good investment in time because uh, you know, if we do these things right, then we don't have to learn from the failure. Uh, in many ways, people have made those mistakes before and we need to, um, we need to take that on board. So uh, again, you know, staffing, having the right numbers of staff, skill mix, um, teamwork, uh, communication, 
you can see things like clinical bundles there uh, for putting in center lines or catheters. So these have, a, again, you know, a good scientific background. They've been proven to work. Um, what we need to do is make sure they're implemented. Early warning scores um, uh, and making sure that, that, that teams kind of use them and know how to use them. But there's a warning here, I think. Um, this is a great uh, uh, example of, you know, where, where people had clearly, uh, you know, uh, figured out what was important. And uh, this is from Peter Pronovost uh, in, in the uh, mid 2000s. And they had developed a, a bundle of care um, uh, for the ICU to reduce uh, central line infections. Um, and it was very clear there was five or six things that you had to do reliably. Um, and if you did those five or six things, well, then um, you would you would be able to decrease your your central line infection and uh, rate. And, and 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 they saw a remarkable drop from 7.7 7, uh, to uh, to 1.4 uh, line infections per thousand uh, line days. And so um, there was a campaign in the UK to to take this and to embed it there because it seemed like really good, simple, straightforward practice. But they didn't get the same. Um, they didn't get the same result. Um, and so there's been a lot of uh, efforts, including this this paper down here from uh, Mary Dixon Woods, who's who's actually from Ireland but is a leading safety researcher in the UK, um, trying to figure out why that was. Why, why didn't these five or six clear things uh, happen when they when they brought this program to the UK? And the big thing was that th there was uh, social and 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 cultural elements. Uh, within the program in the US and Michigan um, that, that were really important. So how they encourage staff, how they use feedback uh, amongst the staff and how they um, leveraged um, the staff being able to speak up. And so th there's something here about the idea of, 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 you know, we imagine something will work, but in reality um, that, that, that when we try to do it, it doesn't quite work that way. And often that's because we haven't really understood what's going on. And that brings us, I think, to our last model here. This is the tail end of safety too, when stuff goes really well. What are the important things? And this is the last um, uh, feature of our model. So promoting success. And, and again, none of these uh, systems approaches to safety can work on their own. We need to do them all together and they all benefit from each other. But this last one here is, is about understanding why things go right. Why, why is work successful? Why is 95% of the care that we do every day successful and delivered without harm? And there's lots and lots of different models for this now, but I would say it's, it's still an area that's evolving. And I think it's, it's an area that we, uh, you know, we, we probably still have to learn quite a bit uh, from. There are some nice examples. I'm just gonna, these might be things you, you may want to, to look at. This is from um, an Australian group um, by a, a, a human factors researcher called Sydney Decker. Uh, it's called Safety Differently. And uh, this is really uh, challenging. And it's not just in healthcare. Um, a lot of the ideas that we have about where safety comes from. Uh, and one of the big things that they, they, they like to talk about is pushing back on the bureaucratization uh, of safety, you know, and that that we need to be careful, you know, that that having more and more rules is not necessarily the way to get, to get safety. So, it is about really understanding the work. It's about good design. It's about good teamwork, um, and and we we need to be careful uh, that we don't fix everything with a, a new rule. This is another uh, really uh, a great example of I think some of the elements of of safety too and promoting excellence. And it comes from a group in the UK um, um, called Learning from Excellence. And um, uh, the, the, the website is there. And again, I'd, I'd encourage people to check it out. They do lots of really good things like excellent reporting where people can um, uh, you know, make a, 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 rather than an incident report, you can report when you've seen an example of excellence and it's fed back to the person who did it. And they use lots of tools like appreciative inquiry and positive psychology for learning. And, and this praise uh, is a lovely example. It, it was a, 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 an antibiotic uh, stewardship project that was only uh, done through positive feedback and they managed to, uh, to improve prescribing and reduce uh, uh, levels of, of uh, antimicrobial resistance through positive feedback only. 
Uh, so, it, it, you know, it's a really interesting approach, and I think it's something uh, that, that it certainly uh, helps to complement other uh, approaches that we take. Just going to speak for the last few minutes about, you know, the important uh, elements, though, that we need to back up safety. So those are our three approaches. So finding and fixing failure, understanding risk and reliability, and then promoting success. But uh, under that, there are a number of features. And I think first and foremost is quality improvement. So if we want to improve patient safety, the same as we want to improve any aspect of quality, we do need to to have the, the tools and the skills to do that. And I think quality improvement brings those together. This is the HSE framework uh, for quality. Uh, you'll find it easily uh, on, on the websites, um, but you know, it brings all those important things, you know, leadership, uh, persons and families, um, uh, staff engagement, improvement methodology. Um, and, and there are, there's a whole branch of improvement methodology around reliability, you know, and, and, and ensuring that the, the critical processes happen. Um, underpinned by measurement for quality, and then finally governance, and then a model of improving care. Um, so uh, that, that no matter what we want to, to improve, it, we have to do it through iterative small steps, uh, learning all the time as we go. So quality improvement, I think, is, is critical for, for improving patient safety. The other, I, I just want to touch on this now, is, is the whole area of human factors. And again, this is back to the scientific basis of safety. And I think um, there are some great resources out there. This comes from Paul O'Connor uh, and Angelo D and Galway now. Um, uh, uh, it's a, a guide to um, an introduction to human factors for healthcare workers. And this is really a fantastic, it's a free book, free to download. Um, and it is about the application of human factors in, in healthcare. Um, and human factors is really, really important, uh, uh, you know, as a scientific, as a rigorous way of understanding our work um, and improving it across so many uh, areas, whether that's environmental design, the design of the work itself, uh, teamwork, simulation, all of these things, I think, are, are enhanced um, by, by bringing the, the, the lens of human factors. Um, and there are some, some great models that have been adapted from human factors, which again is not just about patient safety, uh, but there are some specific patient safety uh, models. This is from Pascal Carrion, the, the SEEPS model, which is on its third iteration, um, and this has been used in, in lots of research and has a practical application. Uh, they've even created a new model there recently, and again, I'm just putting this up for, for, for people maybe if you're interested in human factors. Uh, you know, this is the SEEPS 101 model, which again is a slightly simplified model, but it's simplified to make it practical to real work. So these are tools that you can use to understand your work better, look at workflows, work at, look at, at, at what you do um, to try and look for opportunities to improve. Uh, it's really important, uh, you know, to, to look as well at safety culture. Um, in, in all of safety, um, uh, work. Uh, culture is probably the underpinning uh, uh, feature. And this comes from the Berwick Review, which was, was, was done in, in, in the light of the Mid-Staffordshire uh, scandal in the UK. And, and um, John Berwick from the IHI um, wrote a, a report uh, that sits along the Francis, alongside the Francis report, which was kind of focused very much on the regulatory aspects of, of, of Mid-Staffordshire. Uh, but Berwick wrote a, a report really that was much more culturally focused. And, 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 and as you can see clearly here, he says, in the end, culture will trump rules, standards, and control strategies every single time. And I think that doesn't mean that rules, standards, and control strategies are not important. Of course they are. But if you don't have the culture that's needed for them, then they just won't work. And one particular aspect of culture, and it's something we may come back to talk about, is, is just culture. Um, which is that idea that the right thing happens uh, when, when things go wrong. Uh, and that's a rather complex kind of uh, a bit of culture work. And I think uh, it needs people to really change, especially this idea of restorative just culture, uh, which is very much about healing and, and, uh, and making sure the right thing happens for anybody who's been hurt, including uh, staff and organizations that have been uh, hurt uh, through, um, through patient safety events. Google did a big study in, in, in uh, the mid uh, 2010s uh, looking at what, what it is to, 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 to create perfect teams. Um, and they came up slightly surprisingly, I think, with, with this uh, concept of psychological safety. 
and this is something that's really you know taken uh, root i think in healthcare of course it's always been there um but it's the idea that it's safe to speak up um it's safe to ask questions it's safe to challenge people um and uh, uh you know and and if you if you can do that then uh, everybody is safer and um it's really something that has been recognized more and more as a critical feature of teamwork um within healthcare and i think that 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 makes it into my list of, of really critical things that we need to work on and again there's some nice uh tools that you can use again a lot of it is about modeling uh, through leadership so people making it clear that they, you know they they recognize you know their own vulnerability you know none of us can see everything or anticipate every situation so we need uh, each other i'm just going to give you some again practical examples this is a program we run uh, in in the royal college of physicians uh, that has been uh, supported by the hse particularly around the deteriorating patient program that's uh, uh, what's called uh, the SAFE program and, and we form SAFE huddles. So we take all these ideas of safety and we put them into practice. So safety huddles are brief, less than 10 minutes. They, they, we work really hard to make sure they happen every day. Uh, there, there's uh, an ability for everyone to speak and everyone to listen and, and that uh, regardless who you are, if you're at the huddle, your voice is important. Um, and then, you know, they are great um, places to, to, to demonstrate all those high reliability um, um, skills. So, you know, we, we, we perceive for problems, we understand them, and then we, we try and anticipate and project uh, to make solutions. And then I, the last, I think, critical thing is, 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 is co-production. I think, you know, safety is so complex that we have to do it all together. And of course, all staff need to work together. But the critical uh, people in patient safety are the patients um, and um, uh, this group here and, and we have uh, Tibbs from uh, Patients for Patient Safety Ireland our panel. Um, patients for Patient Safety has a critical uh, role to play I think in helping uh, to, uh, to, to shape patient safety in terms of, of both telling their stories, um, patient stories, but also really the patient insights when we try to come up with solutions um, and, and, and last but not least, you know, the need that patients uh, challenge us and push us to, to, to solve safety uh, as soon as we can. And we do need new ideas. This is a book uh, from, again, Kathleen Sutcliffe was one of the, the people who described high reliability organizations and, and Robert Weir's, uh, again, a researcher and a, a, an emergency uh, physician in the US. Um, this book came out, came out a few years ago, but uh, very much focused on the fact that we've stalled. Um, if you look internationally, we are still at 10 to 15 percent harm. Uh, and of course, complexity has increased, um, but but we are we're, we're, we're stuck causing a lot of harm. And we need to, to maybe look at some of those new ideas around reliability and promoting success as a way uh, to, to, to move us on. So just back briefly to finish on, on the patient safety strategy, uh, you know, why is it important? Well, there's some really good things in there, I think. Um, um, you know, th th there's, there's a recognition, again, that, that people uh, need uh, various things. So for staff, I think it's, it's about having the skills, the information. For patients, again, it, it's to be involved and, and supported. For systems, we, you know, we need to, to join systems up and understand how they work. Uh, and then for organizations, the critical idea of culture there. Um, just to highlight one or two resources, Patient Safety Together uh, is a, 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 um, a new website which, which is trying to bring some of that patient safety learning that comes nationally that needs to be reflected back out. Because if, if someone has learned about a problem or solved a problem, uh, we don't need to wait for people to, to, to have that problem themselves. We need to be sharing this. Uh, safety alerts again these are critical uh, alerts that that uh, we need to share um, and then um, uh, lots and lots of different resources i think that come into that site from time to time um again just to, to to highlight the 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 offerings you know where where do you go to learn more about quality and patient safety this is the prospectus that comes from the quality and patient safety education group within the the qpsd uh, and again, I would just say, just have a look at it, find stuff that, that you're interested. There's a whole range from individual learning up to team learning. Um, and uh, you'd be surprised what's available. Uh, a lot of it's available online. Some of it's available in person and it's all for free. 
And then finally, just uh, Tomas uh, uh, mentioned the book earlier, just, uh, and again, uh, you know, John Brennan and, and, and uh, Peter Lachman, uh, who uh, are both uh, working in Ireland, uh, uh, the other editors uh, on, on this book with me and, and some folks from the UK. But this is very much a book about safety practice. Uh, and I certainly would encourage people to, to, to find a copy and, and use it. So just finally, you know, where are we? Well, this is the WHO Global Patient Safety Action Plan. Um, I think we're very much in keeping with that and the patient safety strategy fits in there. And I think the other word I want you to, to just focus on here is science. So, you know, within the mission there, you know, that, that, that policies, strategies and actions based on science, um, uh, scientific expertise and patient experience. So, you know, patient safety is a science uh, and, and it's recognized by that. And I think you'll find many of the things there uh, are reflected in the Irish models. So seeing patient safety as a science helps. I think it helps to develop interventions and it helps with implementation and improvement. Taking a scientific approach to those is really important. Uh, it's more about, uh, it's, it's more than about preventing uh, and learning from harm. I think uh, that that's an important uh, thing. That's the thing we need to focus on ultimately, but safety is more than that. Recognizing those systems approaches, um, so uh, those three systems approaches, and then looking at those kind of aspects that apply to everybody, that's really important. Um, uh, and, then, and then what's specific to our specialties. Um, uh, so I think some of this everybody needs to do. And then finally, you know, just be aware of, of, of all those, those resources within the patient safety strategy. Um, and, and there are some really good free resources out there. So thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, fascinating talk. There's, I, I have a comment to make about every single slide, but we don't. Let, uh, you don't want to listen to me for the rest of the morning. But yeah, so many points. Uh, your, your driving analogy slide. Uh, unfortunately, I feel like we're operating in the illegally illegal zone a lot of the time in the emergency department. And certainly glad you highlighted things like staffing, because nursing staffing and medical yeah. staff are huge huge issues for us all in terms of patient safety. And I think we're kind of a long way behind the US, but. Thanks to people like you, we're starting to talk about this more and develop sort of m, &M meetings and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I would encourage people to enter into the chat, uh, the quick Q&A box. Uh, you mentioned mid-staffs there. Uh, we have Alan Bowen on the line who uh, was involved uh, afterwards in trying to um, correct a lot of the issues there. I'm sure he would have lots of comments. We have uh, one of the other things that occurs to me is that um, we need to be multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. And uh, in that spirit, we have, a, we have a great panel here, people from different disciplines, um, because the answer, we can't solve everything on our own um, as much as hard as we try. So I'm just going to introduce the panel and then we'll um, kind of open it for questions and discussion and uh, certainly use the Q&A box and the, the, the chat box. So. Um, first up, we have Dr. Brian McCloskey, um, McCloskey Director of Patient Safety and Quality Improvement in the College of Anesthesiologists uh, of Ireland. And um, Brian is an ICU and anesthetist in Belfast in the Royal. Um, we have Lorraine Schwanberg, Assistant National Director for Incident Management within the, within the HSE. We have Dr. Marie Ward, Health Systems Researcher in St. James's and Adjunct Assistant Professor at the Centre for Innovative Human Systems there. And Tibbs Pereira, uh, patient safety advocate with patients for patient safety Ireland, and certainly involving patients, I think is crucial. We've uh, done a lot of work in VTE, uh, venous thromboembolism, to try and improve care in that area. We work very closely with Thrombosis Ireland with Anne Marie, who's a patient advocate. So delighted to have all these people on board. Um, Tim, you have some? Yeah, <laughs> any questions, please use the chat box Q&A. But in the meantime, uh, John, I was going to ask and, and involve the panel as well at the same time, but time management kind of struck, strikes me. Uh, we're all busy and we've got lots of demands and you're going to be a brilliant clinician, a teacher, a researcher, uh, an advocate, et cetera. And then you've got bureaucracy and, and the paperwork increasingly. And theoretically, electronic patient record may make that all better, although there's a debate about that, isn't there? So does that come in, in I mean, in a lot of these... Um, books you refer to in papers and, and is addressed actually because you've got to prioritize. I mean, how do you manage this? I mean, you know, if there's an increasing number of rules and bureaucracy, whether are we just going to be chewed up doing paperwork? Will it actually make a difference to the patient and patient safety? Yeah, it, it's a great question, Tim. And I think it, it's one we, we were at a meeting yesterday with the Department of Health, and, and this question came up 
repeatedly. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think th th there's no one answer to that. I think, I think again, disciplines, uh, and there's others on the panel, Marie may want to speak, you know, disciplines like human factors can really help us look at our work a, a little differently, you know, to, to design it to be safer. I think, you know, that's critical. Of course, that does take time, but it's it's an investment that, that ultimately will return time. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of things that we do every day anyway, like, you know, like communication, like safety briefings that, that are really part of our operational work, that I think we can we can introduce some of these safety ideas. And I think the safe huddle is a, a good example of that, you know, where culture and and so some of these kind of aspects, things like like psychological safety. Um, you know, those are things that we can we can teach people through everyday work. We don't necessarily need to spend a whole lot of time um, uh, outside of that. Now, you know, alongside that, there does need to be time, like we're doing this morning, for 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 formally giving people some of the skills in 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 quality and patient safety. Um, and and there's no easy answer to that. But I think you know the 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 other side of that is can we afford not to do this you know can we afford you know if patient safety is a priority then priority is often what drives you know what what happens to time question that might come back and that might come to dr ward as well but question here is as chi ehr is built how do you see it supporting the development of learning health culture so right. theoretically it might be more time efficient but that depends how it would be any thoughts on that and actually the panel by all means please chip in yeah, can well, I, I just yeah, make, Marie. oh, sorry, John, uh, just two points, I suppose. Um, just safety is a property of the system, and that's whether the system is working well or it's not working well. So I think what, you know, we have to understand that whole system. And Tim, what you mentioned is one aspect of that, all the paperwork, the bureaucracy, what's coming up in the chat is another aspect of that, communication and how we communicate. Healthcare is is the most complex system in the world and we you know we all know that i suppose and it is trying to understand how that system works is one thing whether it's working safely or not we have to understand how it works and we have to look at what are we trying to achieve and how can we design our work such that we achieve that end so just in terms of the epr in st james's as you know we have an epr we are you know coming to terms with that, I suppose, in terms of how that has impacted on communication and collaboration. Um, and we're trying to look at, sometimes we fit these systems into work processes that haven't been designed. So we need to look and start back to basics. And I think this is where healthcare really struggles because we can't do that. We can't hit reboot, you know? So just in terms of trying to design systems, we have to look at, you know, the complexity and then try and understand, OK, where do we put our energy in? We're constantly patching up bad systems. So if our ward rounds don't work, we introduce huddles. Um, you know, so it's trying to start questioning, OK, do we need ward rounds? How, you know, are they working for patients? Um, how does the EPR work to coordinate and communicate and help staff collaborate? So we're finding in James is that the medical staff are using the EPR recording their notes. Nursing staff are using it recording their notes. HSEPs are using it recording their notes. But it has actually negatively impacted on face to face communication. So unless we design the ideal work we want to do and then, you know, put these processes and systems and supports in place to support that, we would constantly be patching up bad systems. Well, up with that then, but that means that you get the ERHA drive change, or is it actually the ERHA should be modeled to fit systems that are already in place? I, I get good systems. Different. Yeah, good systems. Yeah. It's possible. But we have some good systems in place, so the EHRs to complement that potentially and support it. But sometimes the EHRs can be quite rigid, and then hence it will force change in a system that's not ideal. And that's one of the complaints sometimes you've seen certainly over the years within the states that patients our patients were complaining that the doctor sitting at the computer all day putting out forms and not has good doesn't have good eye contact so there's a challenge in both directions there isn't there absolutely absolutely yeah i wonder if could we bring in brian you you've obviously got a direct a, a title within the college of anesthetists and how you tackle these issues of improving patient safety and working it into i suppose the working week <laughs> Well, in, in terms of the college, um, we've got a very clear strategy about 
how we want to, to improve um, patient safety. And that's about improving the, the understanding of patient safety science, making it core to the curriculum um, for, for anesthesiologists. And, and I would, uh, you know, for those of you who have a training role uh, in healthcare, right across healthcare, I would recommend that you look at the WHO um, patient safety syllabus, which is it's 280 pages, but actually it's 280 pages of a really sensible, e easily read information. And so we're basing our understanding, our, our, our curriculum, and we have a program teaching the fundamentals of patient safety and quality improvement. And then at a second level, we want to, we want to get our, our, our young doctors and, and nurses and pharmacists involved in improving quality through a participative program of quality improvement. And again, you do have to invest time, energy, and, and indeed money into quality improvement training. And then at the third level, we want to develop a leadership program. So having, having fellows in, in patient safety and quality improvement. So, so it's very much having that, that everyone has an understanding, everyone in, in healthcare and, and indeed patients and, and carers and families um, are we're all on the same level of having that understanding of, of the fundamentals of, of patient safety. And for me, just for, for very finally, it's about keeping it simple, stupid. So it's about having safe systems, but having a safe culture. And those that element of a safe culture will always beat. Uh, you know, if, if you have a bad culture, it'll beat a good system any day of the week. That's interesting. Um, I, I suppose the College of Emergency Medicine, of which we're fellows, very much kind of mirrors the uh, College of Anesthetists teaching in terms of simulation, human factors, and the, the RCSI does that very well, as well as teaching human factors. Not so sure about College of Physicians um, and, and undergraduate level, you know, how much of this is taught at undergraduate level? Um, is it part of the curriculum? Something I don't really um, have that much insight into. It's been a long time since I was a medical student. Um, and then it's trying to marry. So QIP quality improvement program is, is, is um, mandatory for completion of specialist training in emergency medicine. Probably should be looked at in uh, other disciplines as well. Um, and then there's the issue of, well, yes, we, we have all this theory, but when we're faced with a chaotic department and we're down staff, how we, you know, how we marry that with the, the, the sort of the real world. And that's where we need to, I suppose, interact with HSE more and Department of Health to, to try and address these issues. Um, Lorraine, I don't know if you have any comments to make on been said so far yeah i mean i actually have a question to you so i i think the area of using simulation training is very interesting and we feel like clinicians learn from that i mean do you bring any kind of learning from incidents or patient safety into your simulation training scenarios yes i mean practically every simulation scenario is based on a critically unwell well maybe the patient doesn't start off critically unwell but inevitably they become critically unwell and those most of those scenarios are based on real life, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, patients and scenarios and uh, and that and, and that's embedded in emergency medicine training. I think it's embedded in um, uh, anaesthetic ICU training and um, to some degree surgical training, but not so much in med in college of physicians or in, at undergraduate level. There is a national simulation mm -hmm. strategy which has been published, but again. It's got to have, uh, it's not funded at the moment, so there's got to be funding behind it. So um, certainly yeah. the will is there. Um, yeah, because I, I suppose for incident management for us, we're always trying to see how how we get the learning out and how, how does that get embedded from you know, when things went wrong and how can that be shared more widely. So um, I think you touched on the bureaucratic piece earlier on. So in incident management, for example, we're constantly looking at how could, how can we, um, I suppose, lighten that load and how can we use different approaches to look at incidents or near miss events? Um, so whether it is due, through MDT approach or through after action reviews and things like that, um, so that we get the learning out and, and there isn't that bureaucratic burden associated with it. Yeah, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a change in culture which has started, 
but it requires investment in time and investment in things like the national simulation strategy and in leaders, you know, people, um, fellows, people with uh, appointed positions such as Brian's um, at local level in hospitals and things like that. Um, the will is there, I think, but there needs to be, you know, more recognition that there needs to be funded posts in the same way that we need funded posts in education, we need them in patient safety. Um, Tibbs, uh, we might bring you in from... Yeah, I was going to bring you in with Tibbs, I was just question, I just in relation to patients, I, maybe I'm old fashioned, I may bring John to this as well, because one of my observations is after a number of years is I find um, what's the diagnosis is sometimes getting lost and my sense is that may be increasingly being lost because there's so much other stuff going on or there's a label going but actually what's the cause of the problem our old-fashioned approach of a history exam where is the problem and what is the problem it's the basis of medicine and that can sometimes i think may not be as good as it used to be um, and i find the error happens when you don't have the basic diagnosis of your problem so i'll come back to john that one is that actually something that's coming through in the literature or not and if it's not, why not? Because I think it's an issue. But then that's relevant to Tibbs. I'm going to bring Tibbs. One of the other problems I'm getting old is you've got to say sometimes I don't know. And I'm finding sometimes, increasingly, sometimes expectations of patients coming to me is unreasonable. It's too high and is looking for a cure. And unfortunately, in neurology, which I'm a neurologist, I don't cure many things. And frankly, most medics don't. We actually manage things. So realization that's important and you have to be honest with people. And I find it frequently, so actually, I don't know there. I'm sorry, I don't know the diagnosis. We have to do the following test, figure it out, do the best we can. And I'm not sure how you're going to do it because it, this is difficult because health care is really complex, as Mary said, and patients get sick, unfortunately, and can be a real problem. But that honesty, I think, is helpful sometimes. And sometimes I find patients are a little bit shocked by it because, oh, okay, he doesn't know what we're going to do next. But if you're honest with them, you work with them. Tibbs, any thoughts on that from a, a patient advocacy perspective, and et cetera? Yeah, I mean, uh, thanks for the question. Thanks for uh, providing me with the opportunity, actually, to 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 be part of this. Um, it, you know, at the end, uh, you know, I, I don't know is kind of indicative of a of a good culture. Uh, you know, if you don't know, I, I think, you know, on the other hand, uh, you know, there are responsibilities on both sides, right? There are responsibilities on you as a clinician and there are also responsibilities on a patient to uh to, you know to understand and and be empowered with an understanding of the, the you know what 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 the 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 issues are i think uh you know part of the patient journey is um it, you know realizing that your healthcare professionals don't have the answer to to everything um and you know if if we have we're talking about the you know, implementing the right culture. Uh, and, you know, the answer at times has to be, I don't know. And I, I you know, to me, uh, as, as a patient, I can't pretend to represent every patient out there. Uh, but in my experience, most patients understand that healthcare is complex, that healthcare professionals are busy, uh, and there isn't an easy answer to everything. Uh, you might get some people who might be demanding and, you know, patients are obviously in a very vulnerable position when they're in front of you, right? They, they they know there's something wrong or they're about to hear, you know, that there's something wrong. Maybe it's more serious than they thought. Um, and so they are kind of hoping to get answers to everything. Um, but I think part of the patient journey is realizing there isn't always uh, an answer. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the alternative is to the I don't know. Right? The alternative possibly is to pretend you know, uh, which obviously from a patient safety perspective uh, is, um, is is not the right thing to do. Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, talking about psychological safety, you know, and implementing that kind of culture, you know, a patient safety culture. And if you have a patient safety culture, then, you know, the I don't know if you know, is a generally valid thing. You know, I have a day job as well because I, you know, this is a, a uh, I do this on a voluntary basis, um, and you know, in my experience, saying I don't know um, sometimes takes people aback, but people appreciate you know the frankness. It's not necessarily whether it's a patient or whether it's a customer, you know, in a shop or whatever, whatever it is. You know, people have an expectation initially, or may have an expectation of having the answer, or you know, getting the answers, um, and uh, you know, uh, 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 but it kind of creates a, a better relationship if the answer 
genuinely is I don't know and that's what the patient hears you know and this is what I'm going to do about it here's what we're going to do as a next step you know I'll bring in another specialist or we'll do some research into it or we need to um you know we need to understand your symptoms a little bit more you know whatever the answer is so it's a follow-on from the I don't know that's important is kind of my long way of saying uh, saying it thank you thank you I just want to bring in Alan Bowen here Dr Alan Bowen is um uh consultant here has he just dropped off actually no no um, i haven't i oh, sorry yeah yeah so i've been fortunate enough to um listen to alan's talk about his experience uh post mid staffs and maybe i'll hand over to you alan to tell us about that and, and comment thank you yeah uh, thanks tomas can you all hear me or can you yes. hear me yes. yeah yeah um <clears throat> no I, I, a very good talk thanks very much um i i have to agree um with my experience in stafford the organizational culture and in particular the organizational resistance is crucial to actually getting anything done in any organization and i found that picture you know coupled with the power flow and that extended from um the secretary of state for health all the way down can sometimes make it very very difficult to change anything and um, <clears throat> obviously patient factors i found i'm sorry uh, staff factors i found to be crucial particularly in relation to risk assessment and to who adequate training and then the communication then was the, was the other thing and interestingly Francis gave a great shout out to the medical students because they were the ones who persistently noted that the care was failing and they you know were reporting it back to the university and um, then they went back to the hospital and it didn't seem to, to complete the full loop so so communication again was what was, was crucial there but obviously Stafford um, was an extreme example, I think, um, because of the that it was a total systemic failure of a hospital. And, you know, for six years to try and put that right is incredibly difficult. Um, but a, a lot of the, um, the techniques and a lot of the things you've seen certainly will feed into, as I've seen at the talk, into improvement in patient care. So, um, yeah, I completely agree. But I think the organizational culture is, is crucial. Thanks, Alan. We must get your talk up on the, uh, on our website, actually. Just another couple of comments and questions. Una H, I agree with Tibbs. There's low tolerance for not knowing and expectations throughout the system is challenged when living with imperfection. Um, Darren McLaughlin, thank you for a very interesting talk and discussion, ringing lots of bells for opportunities that are there for us to improve patient safety. Safe Huddle program has incorporated a lot of theory into our practice. Patient safety together will bring benefits also with regards to communications. Um, we're coming up to the uh, hour mark. Um, Any other comments from the panel? John, diagnosis as a key aspect, does it come through the literature or not? Yeah, yeah, hugely. Um, so those two reports I showed you from 1999 and 2001, there was a third report in that series about five years ago from the Institute of Medicine, I think maybe now at the National Academy of Sciences in the US, identifying the need to bring patient safety thinking into diagnosis and misdiagnosis and that that's a whole emerging area and, and something again we could we, we could perhaps talk about at, at another time yeah. the same the same ideas you know human factors understanding how we make diagnoses you know and there's some really nice there's a a, a guy uh, in texas called hardeep singh i think he's written some nice uh, stuff is published in the bmj on how to you know improve or reduce your your risk of diagnostic error but it's a huge error and again like our huge area and like 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 people were saying with the ehr that's a great opportunity to maybe help you know with this but it has to be done right ryan you have a question no it's ju just a comment a fine well final comment from me the two groups of people who you you must you must must use are 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 patient families and carers and, and young people, young doctors, young nurses uh, who, who have the ideas. But one of the things that, that we noticed during the pandemic, you know, prior to the pandemic, we were working with bringing patients and carers and families into groups trying to improve systems. And we lost it over two and a half years. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it stopped on day one of the pandemic. And we haven't got it up up and running again. And it's one of the things that we've got to get, you know, we've got to get back to working with patients to design the systems for them. They, they've often got the answers. And if they don't have the answers, the young doctors and the young nurses and pharmacists and videos will have the answers. Thank you, Brian. There's just a, a last question. Um, 
perhaps abstract. Do you think taking time to consciously use ISBAR would reduce incidents while busy taking the time to do this may reduce them? Um, any, uh, it's difficult to prove this scientifically, John, I don't know, it would seem intuitive. Yeah, you, you know, again, I think is, ISBAR is not a natural way of communicating. However, there's a lot of good evidence to say if you can do it, it really helps. And and you know, if you take that ISBAR three model, which is which is looking at you know not only recommendations but but you know uh, read back and, and risk, um, you know those are things. <laughs> when I do it with with our trainees, you know what we we all do together is we collectively think what's the risk here, you know, for this patient. Maybe maybe it only takes you know a few seconds kind of to to. To highlight that and i think you can use any of these tools i think to model good behavior so the route to culture is through the practice of, of of good safety practices you know and i think it's it's often with culture it's how you do it you know as much as what you do and i think ISBAR is a great tool. I think it takes a little bit of time to embed it, um, but uh, you know, in one sense, it doesn't matter what tool you use. But but you need to be doing something to structure communication and highlight those keys, like a checklist for good communication. Fantastic. Well, I think we're just gone over the hour mark. So this is one of three. Um, we th this is such a vast area um, to explore patient safety and. Uh, themes such as the science of error and recognition of error and how you deal with that and just culture, um, very important topics which we'll be dealing with. So watch this space. Uh, the plan is to do um, webinar two and three last Friday in uh, April and May, same time. Um, so look forward to hearing more from John and the panel. John, your last word? Just to say that, that, that there is a Just Culture conference been planned for uh, the 23rd of May, so I think people should just look out for that. There will be uh, some uh, you know, information going out on that, um, so specifically looking at the importance of Just Culture in patient safety, uh, and I think uh, that's, that's a really important area. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks, panel, and thanks for the attendees. And thank you. Thank and the you. recording will go up on the uh, UCD Health Affairs and Matter Postgrad website for... Uh, for everybody to watch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.